What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Scratch Agency Podcast. Today we have Mike Crowley joining us from Syracuse, New York. He's the owner of his family's agency, the Crowley Insurance Agency. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me. Well, we appreciate no you jumping on with us. This is a special episode for me today because Mike is my mentor, and we're going to talk about the importance of mentorship. As you know, this uh, this podcast talks about scratch agencies, starting an agency, and that's where Sean and I are at right now. And Mike was a huge part in that development for me. Many calls back and forth, and um, many ideas bounced off him, and um, some funny stories I'm sure that we can touch on in this episode. But Mike, before we get into all that, why don't you introduce yourself? If there's people out there that somehow may have not heard about you, introduce yourself, where you're at, where you're calling from, and, and a little bit about your agency. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate that. So I'll be the person you can blame uh, if uh, things go south while you start your agency, I guess. Uh, (laughs) But uh, nope, third generation um, uh, Crowley in the the family business. Uh, I've been doing insurance since the day I graduated uh, college. Uh, Absolutely love this industry. Uh, Absolutely love what we do. Uh, how we do it and I think you know this is the best industry and it's a hidden hidden gem for you know a lot of people um, like I said been in the business for probably about almost 17 years now um, took over the family agency a few years back in the day-to-day operations uh, currently it's just my father and myself as partners uh, and then he is working his way towards retirement next year so uh, it'll be interesting uh, going probably from, you know, partnership to 100% and, and how that's going to work. But very excited for the changes, very excited for the challenge. And uh, like I said, it's uh, it's a great industry to be in, and, and I love it. That's great. Mike, Is um, only because you and I haven't connected before, and I know Steven's been trying to get me in touch with you, so I guess now this is our chance. But uh, <laughs> how? what's your agency makeup? Is it mainly personal, commercial, a little mix of both? We're definitely a mix of both. We are uh, probably about 65, 35 right now, personal to commercial. Nice. Um, That's a good mix. Typical uh, Main Street agency, you can say, you know, back in the, you know, the day of, you know, Main Street type walk-in, uh, you know, walk-in customers, walk-in business, uh, a lot of referral-based things have obviously changed uh, when I got in the business and started to sell, started to, you know, do some marketing, do some, you know, technology advancements. And we don't necessarily need to see people in person anymore. So, you know, the shift has started to change in where we want to go. Uh, on the commercial side, we're very much a generalist, um, but with, you know, little micro niches here and there that we like to try and expand off of. Uh, the team is made up of seven people right now, um, seven full time employees. And uh, nice. yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice. So I think, you know, one of the one of the topics Stephen and I really wanted to uh, dive into um, and clearly you're a perfect guest to have on to talk about this is, you know, the importance of finding a mentor. So a question I have for you is, do you have a mentor and why do you think it's important to have one? Uh, So I don't I don't have one. I have probably uh, dozens of them in different aspects. And yeah. I think there's 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 definitely a difference between uh, finding one that you can you know go to or turn to, uh, and mm-hmm. like I would think that you know Stephen does with myself, um, and then versus one that is you know where you go to different people based on what their expertise is, right? Yeah. So it's not just a general. This is my person I go to. This is you know if I'm thinking about one aspect of the business or operations or sales or whatever the case is, reaching out to that person that I deem to be an expert or somebody that I think is better at this than me or has more experience. So I can say, Hey, what would you do here? How would you do this? Um, and I think that was where the turning point of, um, our agency really has been over the years, probably about six, seven years ago is when I started to branch out on a national level in the insurance space. And when I did that, I met those people. I met those people that are, you know, the experts in certain things. Uh, A lot of people that we all know have met at different things. And, but like, I'll pick up the phone and call these people for, you know, out of, out of nowhere to ask them a question and they answer. Uh, So I look at a lot of them as mentors. And then obviously just having my father in the business all these years, 
you know, as it comes to the insurance aspect, he is um, obviously somebody I turn to for a lot of some, you know, longtime insurance knowledge. Um, and it's, you know, it's great to have been working with him for many years. No, yeah, I, that, I think it's important to kind of share our history between Mike and myself. So um, because there's certainly to Mike's point of, of being intentional with who you're trying to find to be your mentor in different aspects. And um, Mike really became my mentor on pure accident. Uh, I was starting <laughs> to do videos right around when Mike was uh, doing Crowley 101. Um, got some national attention for doing the 101 videos all in 101 days. I was starting to do some videos. Mike just reached out to me on LinkedIn. One thing led to another. We're only 45 minutes away from each other and got together until got together for lunch. That was six years ago. The point of having lunch was to sit down and talk about video marketing. And to this day, we have not talked one minute about video marketing. My point is we <laughs> sat down and talked, tell me about your agency. At the time I was at my family agency, I was going through similar struggles that Mike has gone through it through his journey. Um, things ended up differently on each side, but my point is to just continue to put yourself out there. My question, Mike, is what is your why for being a mentor? You have very openly put a lot of time into myself. You have answered calls late nights. You've talked me off the bridge recently, <laughs> um, as I'm starting my business and going through these things, I think that's why we're laughing so much here is because it's hap it, it, This is, these are all real things that happen before you who, who does it without anything in return and just does it out of the good of their heart. What is your why for being a mentor? You know, you know, it's funny. It's when you, when you surround yourself with good people, you just constantly want to help them, right? Now, there is a definitely a difference based on the person you are helping. Uh, when people are looking for help, guidance, or advice, if they're just constantly asking, asking, ask, asking, and they're not doing anything about it, it's just, just conversations. And I think with you is, you know, I saw something from the very first lunch we had is that I saw something in you and I watched the way you do things. So it's, you know, it's exciting for me to, to help you. And, you know, it makes the drive of wanting to constantly there. Right. Um, it's, you know, the, the industry we are in and the people that are in it, uh, especially on the national level, you go to these conferences and, you know, you just got to experience your first, you know, innovation conference uh, a month ago. Everybody is willing to share and help. And it's because we're a team We're you know, we are a team of independent, you know, insurance agents who, you know, we're trying to compete on a larger scale against direct writers against uh, a captive agents and you know some people that have a lot more money to spend in advertising so i feel like there's like this like you know fraternity or you know bond that we all have together that it's like no we're all just driving together and we want more to succeed and now especially with mergers and acquisitions happening there isn't as many going to be there right there's not as many numbers of agents except for the fact that people like both of you that are saying, no, we're going to start one in 2020, 2021, 2022, we're going to start an agency. And, you know, I love to see that. So if there's like anything that I can help somebody do, I want to do it. Um, because so many people shared so much with me that has changed our agency's path and, and where we are. Um, it's the least I can do to, you know, you know, return the favor to other people that are looking for guidance. Talk about the importance of being coachable. You know, if, oh. if someone's listening to this and they're a producer and they're saying, geez, I'm going to try to do this on my own. And, you know, a lot of people talk about there is that there are a lot of people that are those those number two people that are good number two people, right? Yep. Selling, being the top producer in your agency and owner in your agency is completely different. I've experienced that over the last six months. Sean, you have, and Mike, you certainly have. Talk yep. about the importance of being coachable so that when you, you look at Bob Smith and you want Bob Smith to be your mentor, what traits do you need to make sure that you're, like you said, you saw something in me, what, you know, what, mm -hmm. what traits do you need to have in yourself? So when you sit down and have that meeting and have that opportunity to have that mentor, you, you, you're successful in that. You know, it's, 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 it's funny. You, you, you need to be coachable because that's what drives me to continue to want to help to coach, right? You're not, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, coaching youth sports or coaching, you know, any sport in general, you sit there and it says the kids that are coachable, you put your attention to, 
right? You want to help them because you see that drive for them. They listen versus, you know, even if it's the all-star that's sitting over here that's uncoachable, you don't want him on your team. He's the bad egg. And it's no different in the world of business. You need to be willing to learn. You need to be willing to be vulnerable. You need to be willing to, you know, take chances and, and risks. If I thought, and, and this goes back to just even us, but if I thought that you were destined to be a, a great number two, I would have just tried to pry you away from your family agency and come work for me like that. You know, that was the like that was coming <laughs> like, but, but that's, that's, the, that's the truth. And, and I had some people ask me, well, why don't you just bring him in? And I said, well, that'd be great, but I don't see that's where his destiny is. Like he, he wants, he has the vision to, you know, be the, be the leader of this. Uh, so it would be a temporary hold. And I don't think that's going to help him. Right. Because he might actually get comfortable here. And if he gets comfortable, then all of a sudden it would he would not go that far and he would not reach his potential. And I think that's where, you know, seeing that in you is the, re the reason and the path that we, we've taken our relationship and why we want to, you know, continue to strive, you know, one step further every single day, make get 1% better every single day. And it's because you have that drive, right? Um, the kids that don't, or the people that don't, or the, you know, whoever you're coaching or mentoring, um, you're going to be the ones that, you know, are destined to work for somebody else. Right. And whether you're a number two or a number five or another 10, it doesn't matter. This is where, um, the coachable and wanting to strive to get better is such a key to whether you're going to be a successful business owner or not. Yeah. And I think going back just before I forget, uh, I wanted to bring it back to the mentorship. Uh, I love what you said about not having just one person because it's so when I first opened my agency, I was telling Steve this last time we spoke, the biggest mistake I made in this space, I've been in the industry almost 11 years now. The biggest mistake I made was that I didn't connect with other people within the insurance industry. Um, but when I started doing that, like you said, you start meeting people that are experts in specific niches or, you know, whether it's someone like Dr. Billy Williams is someone who I work right. with, who's, I mean, when he told me about processes, procedures, and standards, my mind was like blown. I was like, oh yeah, I have all that in here, but <laughs> you know, I don't have it written down anywhere. Um, right. So he helped me get all that stuff on paper. Then you have someone maybe like a uh, David Carruthers, who's just like a, a sales genius and knows all the wedges um, and can help you focus on KPIs. You have someone like Carrie Wallace with agency planning. So I yep. think you're right in the sense that every mentor has what they're an expert in. Um, and I'm in the same boat as you, Mike. Like I have a few different people I go to depending on the situation um, and, and kind of run it that way. So I, I just thought it was awesome that you brought that up. And also too, for someone, for someone new into the industry, and I think this just stems off uh, mentorship that I wanted to share. I heard this, this interesting analogy the other day, and I think I shared this with Stephen already, that we're all in these different rooms, right? So for instance, like Stephen and I, we've been in the industry for 10 years, we're in the 10 year room, right? So to speak. Yeah. Then you have people maybe like uh, Billy Williams, who's in the 20 year room. And then you have the select few that are in that 30 year room. And I yep. think for anybody new or in the 10 year room, you want to surround yourself. And that's something I live by is like, I want to surround myself by other people that are in that 20 and 30 year room because they've all been through what I've been through. They've made all those mistakes and I can kind of learn and take from that. You know what I mean? So Absolutely. that's kind of how, that's kind of how I do it. And that's kind of the advice I would give to somebody new into the industry. But um, if somebody was new in the industry, uh, let's just say as a producer, like what, what mm -hmm. kind of advice would you give to them? Would they a producer that would like to branch off on their own specifically? Yeah. Let's just, let's just say new to the, new to the industry, new to the industry. Okay. Um, I think, <laughs> I think your what you said was your biggest, one of your biggest mistakes is not reaching out and, and, and networking yeah. with people is, uh, probably one of the, um, best advice is that any young or new person in the industry could have because I, when I joined, I joined a very successful long-term insurance agency. If yeah. I wanted to ride that same path, I could have wrote it and I could have wrote it forever. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the path that I wanted to go. I saw something different. And if it wasn't for reaching out, 
meeting, getting out of my comfort zone, um, and building some of these relationships, I would have never ch- made the changes in our agency that we've done. And, you know, it's been very successful. And I think 100%. that's the key is that you can't just focus on your current employer, your current local network of insurance people. You know, I'm very involved mm-hmm. with, you know, the big eye on a local basis. Yep. So I have great relationships with all the local, you know, agency owners and, and, you know, higher up people. And I, yeah, sure. I could have reached out to them. Are they as willing to share? Probably not. Um, and that's just the nature of things, whether it's the nature of their age in the business. Um, you know, I feel like the, the, the sharing is something that came around over the last five to 10 years. The people that have been in these positions for much longer than that still has that old mindset of like, I'm not sharing that information with you. You might poach my people. (laughs) You might, you know, you start doing these things where on a national level, it doesn't do that. Or on a bigger, bigger level, it doesn't do that. And, and I think that's the key is that you got to get out of your little, you know, window or buffer, right. Of, of insurance, you know, knowledge and, the more you do that, the more your eyes open up, the more, yeah. and the more you implement, the more you're going to do. Um, the other thing that I would give advice for anyone young, uh, is to get out of your comfort zone. If people yeah, knew, if people knew me back in, you know, high school and they said, and I wasn't a quiet person, but I was not somebody that would be comfortable on video, right? Mm-hmm. By any means. And if I look back at even the videos that I started when I started, you know, six years ago or so, I would, and I laugh at them sometimes. I'm like, these are so bad, (laughs) right? And then now I've been on stage twice talking to hundreds of others, which I would have never thought in a million years I would do. It's, you know, once you start to do some of these things, no matter what it is, right? But just anything that is just a little bit uncomfortable, the results from that are so great that it just continues to allow you to grow as a person. And when that happens, business is going to grow, your opportunities are going to grow, and it does not stop. It's like the people that just keep coming up with excuses that, oh, I can't do this because of this, or I can't, I'm not doing this because of this. It's like, listen, those are not, like now I'm just calling excuses out. Um, yeah. and I recently did that at the conference that we were at, you know, Steven, we, you know, somebody was like, Oh, I still haven't, you know, implemented this. I've been paying for the software for four years still. And I'm thinking, all right, you have no excuse. Like I go, do you want to jump on a call next week? And I'll train you exactly what to do and how to do it and make it go fast. Cause if that's, if that's your hold up, I'll do it right now. Let's just put it in our s- schedules. And, and they said, Oh no, I no, I know. I know how to do it. I just haven't, you know, started doing it. It's like. Yeah. Okay. But those are excuses. Like don't have, make excuses. You're just uncomfortable doing it and you haven't started it yet. And that's the reason. So the more you can get uncomfortable, uh, and the faster you can get uncomfortable, the better. David Goggins always says, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Exactly. One of my favorite lines. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So flipping that coin and Mike, I want you to touch on this. The importance of not comparing yourself to others. Mm Mm-hmm. When Huge. looking to, okay, let's, because I, I think in this podcast that we're doing, the Scratch Agency podcast, I think there's really kind of the people that are looking to start an agency, but I also think it's the people that may be just producers at agencies that are looking to take it up to the next level and, and um, you know, looking to uh, find in their craft of, of producing more business, whatever it might be. Not comparing yourself to others. Touch on that because you got, I was on a call with Taylor Garcia the other day. And he was talking to me about a homeowner's account. He's got this twenty-two thousand dollars up here in upstate New York. Our average premiums what twelve to fifteen hundred, maybe. You know, so if we're you, lucky, <laughs> right? So you look at like you know, you can go to these conferences, and exactly the IOA conference that we went to in Nashville is what we're referring to. And Mike called me, I think, the day before the, I flew out, and was like, "It's going to feel like you're drinking from a fire hose," and it was exactly that. And you know, don't compare yourself to other people. Um, take in as much as you can, write as much down, but pick those two or three things that you can do. Anyways, I digress. But what what is the importance of that from a, either a new producer standpoint, a producer is trying to take the next level, or somebody who's starting an agency about comparing yourself to others in the national realm of things, if you will? 
Yeah, I mean, the the national realm is the, the, the key to that, right? If, if you wanted to compare to another local agent when it comes to, you know, how much business you're growing, how much your producers are selling or you as a producer are selling, you know, that could creep in a little bit. I wouldn't do it, but that makes a little bit more sense. Like you said, you can't compare it to what other people in other states are doing because of just premium differences, right? Operational differences. The more I've gotten to know a couple, you know, agencies uh, on a more detailed level, it's amazing. Everybody can run an agency differently um, and be very successful. Okay. And that's the beauty about this. You do not need to be all following the same path down the road in order to reach what we think is success. Everything is different. Money follows it differently and it's fine to do it the way you want to do it. I think the biggest thing has to do with uh, making sure that you are setting the goals for yourself and for your agency and you are trying to hit those in, in that realm, right? Um, without looking outside of it. And, and, and the reason is, you know, are you profitable? Are you writing good business for the carrier partners you have? Uh, are your carrier partners happy? You know, I used to joke sometimes and said, man, if I had the volume and the confidence that I do that like some of the larger agencies have, I'd get carriers to do almost anything for me because I get carriers to do things for me all the time. And I look and I'm like, yeah, but I only got 300,000 volume with them. <laughs> like Matt, if I had millions right. of it behind, I'd be asking for things all the yeah. time just because of the relationships I built with them. That's to say, like, you can't compare the two because if they're running a 250-person shop and I'm running a seven-person shop, they're just different. I'm not going to write $5 million of new business. That's just not the, the way that our agency is. But you have to still make sure that, you know, are, am I doing something, you know, the right way? Am I profitable? Am I setting us up for success? And I am keep moving in those steps. If you're doing that in writing X, that's great. If you're doing this and you're, you're only doing that, that's fine too. There is no uh, set of blueprints for running an agency or selling as a producer. You have to adapt to what you're doing. You might be a personal line salesperson, absolutely crushing it in upstate New York, writing you know five hundred thousand of pers personal lines premium, you know, a year organically. Okay, that's great. Okay, but a commercial shop at five hundred thousand might not be good. You know, based on the type of business you're going after, what your comp plan is and whatever the case may be. So that's why it's like when you're talking to other people and you're starting to network with people, don't take numbers seriously that they say. Don't take plus, – plus, is everybody even telling the truth half the time? No, uh, especially as a producer. They're, they're, you know, they're trying to make them sound yeah. like, you know, bigger and badder than they are. So, you know, look at Just that. Just round like, up to hey, the nearest 100,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or a million, right? You know, I, yeah. I write about up a million a year. Uh, yeah, really? Well, I think it was about three hundred thousand last year. No, but no, it's <laughs> you. You just you just can't do it. And and I think the more, you know, and that's just on the sales volume. But the more technology that comes into place, and the people start talking about, oh, we have this operation, and we have this, um, you know, automation, and we have this technology that does this. You know, that all sounds great, but. Like, that's why it's so great that you'll call me sometime. What do you think about this? And I'm like, yeah, in two years, don't even think about it now because you're not at that stage of needing to implement this. It just sounds yeah. great. And that might be the vision of where you want to go, but you can't just look and think, oh, well, that person has it. Well, good. Let that person have it. But they might have an unlimited budget right now. Right. And they have yeah. a team of people. They, might have they have partners. You know, yeah, okay. exactly. I, so that's the kind of stuff you got to really hone in on and then just keep going one step at a time, one day at a time, one month at a time, one year at a time and figure it out. The other thing is, you know, and this doesn't really have to be about comparing with others, but when you're listening to what they're doing, them implementing some of that stuff might be trying to solve a pain point that they have. Right. Or they're hiring people because they don't yeah. they the owner can't sell. Or, you know, they're hiring a CFO because they can't open QuickBooks, right? And they just don't know how to. Like, there's reasons behind why people do certain things. Those might not be whoever else's pain point. And yeah, I think that's the key. their weaknesses. Right, right. And I, you got to always remember that because everybody's going to have weaknesses in different areas. So 100%. one of the biggest takeaways I took from the conference and, and I guess takeaways that I'm experiencing now, only being six months in as an agency owner and coming from a long traditional family run agency 
and the reason I asked you that question is there's so many different ways to slice the pie. Mm -hmm. I am setting up T5, the complete opposite of how my family agency that I left was running. You know, yep. they, they take cash payments. I take no cash. You know, we're a hybrid model. They're office only. Um, you know, all of these different things. And it's been exactly that. Mike just said, I give them a call. Hey, this is, you know, this looks like it'll help me. But will it really? No, you're right. Okay, right. thanks. Mike talks me off the bridge again. But yeah. my point is, like, it's going to happen. And, and even mm -hmm. e even at your point, Mike, I'm sure it happens, right? It's going to, oh, you're going to get, and I don't want to call it the shiny object syndrome because I think I'm trying to describe it as something different, but um, there's so many different ways and you have to find whatever process to your point, Sean, or whatever procedures work for your agency, work for your niches, your clientele, and whatever that is. If you have, if you, if you take over an old family agency, like I was potentially going to do and Mike did, and a large book of the business is over 70 years old, glove box is going to be hard, right? right? But, you know, if you have a startup agency where this is the way we do business and this is how you, you know, can train them from a pup, if you will, it's a completely different aspect. So I think, I think it's just a, a super interesting conversation because you look at all these things, oh, this is the way to do it. You want to make 500000 in revenue a year, This do it this way. But there's so many different ways to slice the pie. It's, it's, it's funny. <laughs> I've learned over the years and I've wasted a lot of money by, you know, adapting or trying to adapt some of this technology or, you know, different things. And all of a sudden they would just sit there, right? I'd have username and passwords to different things and they wouldn't get implemented <laughs> because it wasn't a pain point. It was a yeah. thought. It was a thought, man, this would be great. So again, you don't want to call it shiny object, but it's more of like, this is the vision of where I want this, but are my customers ready for it? do they are they asking for it do they need it do they need you know if the answer is no to those things it doesn't matter what i want it's what they want and and, and you're yeah. right there there's there's different agencies and there's different you know models and being able to implement certain things into different ones you know covid luckily kind of you know sped up that process for consumers to eventually start utilizing things a little bit more if that never happened I would still have people flying through our front door to pay cash. I would still have people, you know, doing, you know, coming in and, you know, wanting to do, you know, some transaction, like without making an appointment or, you know, doing any of these things. Yeah. That would have been a hard force on our end as the agency to say, no, 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 we're no longer doing this. I need you to do this. It would have taken a long time to implement because the, the customer wasn't ready. Luckily, you know, what happened in the world forced it. And yeah. luckily the technology was there that we were already like moving on the side, but it, you know, if that never happened, well, you know, we'd still be doing that because that's the way a 70 year plus agency was run. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, you know, luckily we're, we're moving in the right direction, but again, I see a lot of people saying, oh, I'm really struggling to get my you know customers to look at this. And I'm like, well, did they need it? Did they want it? And if they don't, then your expectations yeah. are too high. Yeah. I mean, and then it's also too key. realizing like with some of those pieces of technology is, you know, how much time and effort you need to put into implement, like implement it, like you said, getting it into the customer's hands, following up with them to make sure they sign up for it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's sometimes a lot more work than you anticipate, you know, you know, a lot of people, uh, I'll, I'll say this too. And I'm like, I don't use any automation for my existing clients. And, and they look at me like, wait, you don't have anything set up? Like they expected me to. And I said, well, no, that's because it wasn't a pain point for our agency. And I'm like, and honestly, I'm way too anal to just let something just go on cruise control because one software, it's telling another software that this person might be a monoline home customer and it's gonna send cross-sell campaigns. Listen, if my people or myself can't cross-sell somebody, I don't need a system to do it. And it's going to be look worse when we actually do have their auto and it just happens to be in their spouse's name first and the two systems don't talk well to each other and it doesn't get cleaned and all of a sudden it looks worse to me. Um, so, you know, on that stuff, I never put that through. And it doesn't affect us, you know, in one way or another. Now, could we potentially do more because of this? Maybe. But... You know, again, yeah. pain points. What's the pain point? What's the operational pain point? What's the sales pain point? And I said, you know, if you if you sell three lines of business at you know at close every time, you don't need to cross sell. <laughs> you can yeah. you can just you know rock on. So I mean, it's 
there, there's different there's different things and again there's different ways to you know slice the pie up and and that's the beauty about this business mike last question and i wanted to save this one for the last if you woke up tomorrow morning and were faced with the challenge of starting a scratch agency mm-hmm. what one piece of advice would you give to yourself if i was starting scratch with no customers and i think that's the key for somebody that wants to start scratch is uh, do they have customers can they take customers with them? Do can they do they have a book? Um, you know, do they have a non compete? You know, whatever the case may be. Um, if I went with a zero, I would spend eight hours a day prospecting and and selling for the first probably two years. I would work my absolute tail off for to build uh, as much revenue to come into the agency. Um, as fast as I could so that I can then stop and slow and build it slowly from there, right? Uh, because money is such a big issue when it comes to operating. And I think one of the best ways to do it is to v- just eventually start just to sell. Uh, the other thing that I would do and I would say is the biggest, 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 biggest mistake um, that I did was you. I didn't document the way I was making changes to our processes and procedures fast enough right from the start. I was changing things on the fly with very bad training for my staff and almost like the expectation that like they should be picking it up. They see what I'm doing, right? Um, I would, if I was sitting alone by myself in my office or in wherever I'm selling and doing stuff, absolutely everything that I would be doing, I would be, you know, recording. I would be, you know, having, you know, snippets from, you know, a service like Tango um, and just recording absolutely everything possible so that the moment you hire somebody, they have a playbook that is as big as anything you've done and it is sitting there ready because (laughs) there is nothing that is worse than if you were on this, you know, this huge selling, you know, streak and you're you know you're selling like crazy and you're like i finally need an employee i can't do this anymore let's bring them in okay i gotta train them all right let me stop selling and sit with you for a while and train you no Mm -hmm. no there's nothing worse you know for 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 an agency you're gonna lose all momentum and it's just gonna be a problem but if you can plug somebody in whether they know what they're doing or not but they can immediately get into this is the playbook for you know our agency here's step by steps on how to do anything if you can't find it in here, then come ask me. Um, that would be that would be the the best advice that anybody can ever give. The problem is people have been saying that for many years. Document your process. Document this. You know, write this down. If you don't do it, there's no implementation. It's not going to work. So actually implementing that is probably the key. Not just hearing about it and like saying, okay, yeah, that makes sense, Mike. And then all of a sudden, you know, you go back to your agency and you don't do it. That's that's going to be the problem because trust me, I did it for for years as I was making changes. Honestly, I didn't document the stuff until you know a couple years ago when I was homesick with COVID in my room and locked in and couldn't do anything for 14 days. Back at that time, I was like, screw it, I'm going to start writing everything down, and I just started you know documenting everything. Um, if if that never happened, would I have ever done it? <laughs> Who knows? So, right. um, again, I was years and years and years past when I should have done it. Um, I would do that right from the start as you're selling. So eight hours a day selling and prospecting, you know, two hours a day documenting. <laughs> Does that sound sure. familiar, Sean? <laughs> it literally five minutes before you hopped on, Mike, we were talking about the same exact thing. Just document really? everything before you. Yeah. yeah. That's so funny. You, I mean, you basically just said everything we said before the call. It's awesome. Well, That's I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I, I still, I still, I still sit here t- at times and I'm like, oh, I got to find a way to like sit down with everybody and walk through this one thing because yeah. it's new to them. I've never stopped. Maybe I'm doing it and using it, but that doesn't mean mm-hmm. that this is the way, right? And that's, you yeah. know, that's the thing is because, you know, how many carriers do you represent? A whole bunch. How many uh, technologies that aren't carrier systems do you use? Eh, a handful. How many of this do you use? Well, everything is different and everything is changing. When you have a staff and you have people doing these things, it's not easy for them to just, oh, I'm just going to pick everything up that, you know, Mike's throwing throwing down because they're in the middle of their jobs. They're in the middle of doing their work. And it's not, you know, it's not the same across the board. 
So it's, you know, it's one of those things where it's like the more you can do when you don't have people, right, the better. Because you can plan it so you know exactly what to do. The other thing that I would do along the way is to think, okay, what are some of my biggest problems that I have that I need off my plate? It's almost like if you're going to hire like a virtual assistant or, you know, a virtual employee. And a lot of times they say when you train them, you want to train them on one or two things right off the bat. Let them get really good at it, you know, and then add something to their plate. And it's almost like setting that training program in place so that when you do hire somebody, they're not just looking at, you know, a book and saying, yeah, these are all, you know, T5's processes, right? Or these are all every how to do everything. Well, is it in order? Is it in, you know, the way that they're going to take something off of your plate? No, it's just a big textbook of stuff that they would just have to go through. And it's almost like, no, no, I'm going to create the marketing plan that says, okay, you're going to start on page five of that textbook. And, you know, for the first Mm -hmm. week, this is all you're going to do. And it's going to take that off my plate. Then you're going to do this. And then you're going to do this. And, you know, uh, Billy Wagner is somebody that I look up to a lot. And he spoke at the innovation conference. And he mentioned he has a 12-week program. And he goes... If they need help attaching a document to an email, we'll have them do that for 20 straight hours until it's mm. not something that needs to take, you know, or they even second guess on how to do it. And yeah. does he really give somebody uh, the job of attaching a document to an email for 20 hours? Knowing Billy, probably, but that's just him giving that example of saying, okay, there's this one thing. You need to type ID cards, okay? We're in New York. We've got to use ID card generator to type this for a whole bunch of carriers. I'm just going to have you type them all day, every day. Type them, type them, type them, type them, type them. Now you know exactly what to do, how to do it, where to go, and you have the whole system down. Now we're going to move on to doing an insurance binder. Let's do a binder, 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 binder. The more you get the uh, uh, repetition in there, the better they're going to be at those things. But doing that in the order where it's going to help you, right? So you guys are going to hire that first employee or some other scratch agency is going to hire that first employee or first person. It's going to be like, all right, I'm doing the sales. I'm doing the service. I need you to take off some of the service aspect. Okay, what service aspect? You know, answering the phone? Okay, great. Teach them how to answer the phone. Teach them how to talk on the phone. Teach them how to record, you know, do the things that they should do on the phone. Not just be like, uh, yeah, hi, let, let me see if Steven's available, right? Let me see if Sean's available, you know, and it's like, you know, you don't need a receptionist. You need somebody that's actually going to be able to take that, you know, right. you know, you, you don't need them to just be the buffer to give you the phone. You need them to be able to handle the phone and then, you know, figure out what that's going to be and train off of that in a specific order so that they are, you know, useful for you right off the bat. Um, I think that is that is huge, right, and that's yeah. a big key. That's good advice. Well, let's wrap this thing up, Mr. Crowley. Thank you very much, Sean. You got anything to to add before we wrap up? No, here? that's it. No, that's it. It was good to uh, finally get to talk to you and connect with you a little bit more, Mike. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm assuming we should probably hop on a call at some point and just uh, shoot the shit a little bit more. But uh, it was yeah, awesome absolutely. talking to you, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, hey guys, I love. My- Go ahead, Mike. I was going to say, I love that what you guys are doing. Um, I, I hope there is more of you out there that are, you know, taking that leap to start agencies. Um, you know, whether they're in a positions where they just were unhappy and this is, the, you know, not the vision that they want. Whether they're changing careers, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, those are the those are the people that need to listen to you guys. Um, you guys are you, you guys are running down this or climbing up this ladder in, in, in a way where, you know, it's it's different uh, compared to what other people have had to go for uh, or go through. Um, but I think this is where, you know, any young professional that is looking to start this or go out on their own, they need to listen to these things. They need to hear um, from people like you. And basically that what you guys are doing is documenting your process right now of how to how to do this and how not to do this. You know, let's go through our failures. Let's go mm-hmm. through some of the struggles we have. So it's going to help somebody else. And I think that's awesome, uh, especially because, you know, starting a scratch agency, you guys are still wearing tons of hats, right? You're not just one hat. You're wearing tons of hats and taking the time to do this uh, for the industry is great. So uh, kudos, kudos to both of you guys. Thanks, Mike. Mike, why don't you uh, just uh, tell people where they can get in touch with you, find you, connect with you, whatever that might be. Uh, I think the best place probably to connect would be on LinkedIn, Uh, but I'm on all the socials. You can find me anywhere um, and reach out. Um, 
and I'm very active on most of them. So, you know, reach out to me, send me a direct message. Uh, if you want to shoot me an email, it's Mike at Crowley And, uh, I'd be glad to help anybody uh, that's listening. Awesome. awesome. All right, everybody. That's another episode of the scratch agency podcast. Mike Crowley from Crowley insurance. Thank you all for joining us. Do us a favor, like the show, share the show, subscribe, send it out, get the message across. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you so much for listening or watching that episode of the Scratch Agency podcast. We really hope you enjoyed it. We hope to see you next time. If you have any questions, you can reach out to myself or Steven on Instagram or LinkedIn. And we'll see you next week.